PE prep, seismic specific, problem number two in our series. Let's get into it. Seems like kind of a quick one here today. If you know it off the top of your head, good for you. Circle the right answer and get the heck out of here. If not, stick around. Uh, which statement is true for the effective seismic weight of a structure that has a flat roof snow load of 55 PSF? This is a problem about, as it states, effective seismic weight. That criteria you're going to find in chapter 12 of the ASCE 7. Specifically, we'll be using the ASCE 716 for this code cycle, but the 722 is coming up in the not too distant future. But if we fly over to chapter 12, specifically 12.7, we'll find what we're looking for. This gives you, as it suggests, modeling criteria based on the analysis procedure that you're doing for your seismic design. However, under modeling criteria, you need to know what the effective seismic weight is of your structure that you're analyzing because the weight of a structure directly corresponds to the forces that you need to design that structure for. We all know that in seismic design. 12.7.2 finds us at effective seismic weight, right on the money. Now, the effective seismic weight, W or capital W, uh, of a structure shall include the dead load as defined in section 3.1. That's just taking you back to uh, the dead load chapter and where the definition lies for dead load. Above the base and other loads above the base as listed below. So effective seismic weight all boiled down is just the self weight of the structure, the dead load. But they say as well as some other things sprinkled in for special conditions. If you are taking the PE, it's not just gonna be as straightforward, I wouldn't think, as just saying, uh, the dead load. They're gonna give you one of these little exceptions, and you're gonna need to know them. And I think today's example captures just that. What are these extra bits besides dead load that you need to be thinking about when calculating your seismic mass? Well, listed below, and we have items one through five. In areas used for storage, minimum of 25% of the floor live load shall be included. So storage under the live load chapter, chapter four of the ASCE seven, specifies at least in the engineering side of the definition of storage, it means a room that has a significant amount of weight that can be inside of it at any given time. So uh, I believe we have two different types of storage criteria that you can design for, light storage and heavy storage. I believe what light is 125 PSF. Heavy is like 200 or 250 PSF. I don't know, uh, correct me on that if I'm wrong there. So because there's such a significant amount of weight that could be located in these areas, that can contribute to the seismic mass of a structure and affect the design of your structure. So they say, hey, if you have storage zones, you have to be thinking about this and you need to grab some of that, uh, some of that design weight. They give you exceptions here. We're not gonna get into them just because uh, today's example is talking about snow, so you know that you can kind of just skip item number one here, but I just like talking through it with you. Number two talks about where the provisions of partitions, ooh, say that fast, is required by section 432. Again, that's in the live load chapter. The actual partition weight or a minimum weight of 10 PSF of floor area, whichever is greater, shall be included. Again, this one actually I have to do a lot. Um, this comes into regular engineering design quite often, especially if you have like office space that you're designing for, some type of flex area, which I think in a lot of structures nowadays is commonly designed for. Um, but that's as far as we'll talk about that one today. Item three, total operating weight of permanent equipment. Now, permanent equipment. Well, again, this isn't our topic today. They're not talking about, you know, the printer in the HR department. Um, that would be considered live load. They're talking about the big honking HVAC unit that's you know 20,000 pounds that is bolted to the floor and it ain't moving. Um, it's gonna be there for the lifespan of the structure. Use your engineering judgment because you're all engineers um, as opposed to what that may mean and what that is defined as. Number four. Uh, oh, we got something about snow here. So I think this is where we want to be. Where the flat roof snow load, P sub F, exceeds 30 PSF, and they also give you an SI units for anyone not US based, 20% of the uniform design snow load, regardless of actual roof slope. This is where we're gonna find ourselves today. We know that we have a flat roof snow load of 55 PSF for our problem, which is P sub F. We have 55, that is greater than 30, so that's the threshold, which means that this item number four, 
comes into play and we need to be including some mass or some weight from the snow load, uh, 20%. So in order to do that, uh, you'll literally just be taking 20% or 0.2 times your flat roof snow load. That'll get you, let's do it on the fly. That gets you 11 PSF, which needs to be included on the roof um, when calculating your overall effective seismic mass of your structure or your effective seismic weight. I keep saying mass and weight, I know those are different because the theory is that, is there going to be a design level earthquake in the middle of the winter? Let's say there's a 50-50 chance because let's say half the year uh, in an area of the world where there's snow, you might have snow and the other half it's summertime so there's no snow. So there's a 50-50 shot for a full 365 days uh, where an earthquake could strike. But what about areas where there's not that much snow? It only snows a little tiny bit, like here in the Pacific Northwest on you know lower elevation regions. All right, now it's only maybe one month out of the year where you may have some snow. Okay, now the probability is less that that major earthquake will happen when there was just a snowstorm. And that snowstorm didn't even drop that much snow. So now let's fine tune the exception even more and give you that threshold of, well, we're really talking about areas that actually see a good accumulation of snow on a regular basis. Um, so now all of a sudden we're up in Alaska or something, or just in a higher elevation portion of the US where snow can accumulate. You can get those big storms, one, two, three feet of snow, and it stays around because it stays cold. Now, all of a sudden, the probability of a major seismic event after a snowstorm um, might be slightly higher. So for those areas, um, they are saying you need to grab some amount of the weight of snow and lump it in to the weight of your structure that you're designing for your seismic system for. And there you have it. That's really kind of the background to this is probability, probability, probability. What's the chance that there's some snow on your structure when the earthquake happens, which would then make your structure heavier, which would then increase your, your seismic forces that you're designing for. 11 PSF would be a numerical answer, I would say, but really it's the 20% that we need to take into account. So let's head on back. And one more small bit here is that they say regardless of roof slope. So you don't need to take it a step further and then be solving for P sub S, if I can draw an S correctly, which is your sloped roof snow load. So you don't need to get into that and start figuring out, you know, geometries of snow and then take 20% of those geometries and, you know, fine tune it on your roof. It's not that complex. They just want to capture some amount of weight of snow. So they just say, hey, your flat roof snow load, apply it across the roof area, 20% of that, we're moving on, okay? It doesn't always need to be so complex. It's more of a catch all. If we go green, I would say B is gonna be our answer. 25 or 20% 20 of the uniform design snow load must be included. That's it for today. It's that simple. Hey, like and subscribe before you go. We're starting with the PE Seismic uh, series. I'm gonna do, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 examples. Then we'll move on to maybe some more in-depth design problems. I know I got uh, concrete shear walls and boundary elements. Someone has asked for steel moment frame connections. Someone has asked for, so. Good luck on your studies. Thanks for watching. Thanks for learning. And thanks for subscribing. Catch you in the next one. Later.